All right. So um, without further ado, let's give a warm red light welcome to our first guest. The one, the only, the legend, George Christie. Welcome to Red Light to Show. Thank you. What's up, man? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I walked into this. I had no idea what was happening here. This is uh, <laughs> quite a show. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a comedy show. We try to, to, to do what we can and, and also put on musicians um, from Ventura, Ventura County and, and try to celebrate their art, you know? Right. Because, um, I mean, let's just be honest, the state of music's pretty bad, wouldn't you say? Well... Sounds I'm into noise. the uh, old music myself. Yeah. What are you into? Well, on the way over here, I was listening to Wilson Pickett, Talking Heads. Uh, then I have, uh, I've just got to Spotify. I have a friend that's a, a record producer, and he mm-hmm. turned me on to this uh, Spotify. I didn't know anything about it. And what it does is it, you play these songs and then it'll send lists to you. Of, uh, but I guess that's probably not that amazing for people that are into this. <laughs> but for me, it's amazing. It's like they're reading my mind. <laughs> uh, all right, that's cool. Like, uh, I, I love all music. Like, uh, when I was growing up, my dad, he was a hippie, you know. Right. And so there was a lot of, you know, classic rock there. Right. And, and so, in my stepmom, she was really into oldies. And so it just. Like, that's when my love for music started. And then I just loved everything that's came out, except for the last freaking 10 years. Well, you know, uh, up in the Bay Area, I wound up uh, hanging out with uh, a lot of people up there, the Grateful Dead. Uh, oh, no. And right. uh, that was a whole scene in itself. It's, uh, you know, a traveling circus in a way. And uh, so I became, you know, pretty good friends with uh, Garcia. Jerry and I became pretty good friends. And... Uh, the rest of the guys, but I had an exceptional uh, close relationship with Jerry. I, he'd come down here, I'd pick him up at the airport and whatnot. And, and that's uh, when you were up there in Oakland? It, up in the Bay Area, yeah. yeah. Why did you end up coming, like, why, why, would you, why did you choose Ventura? Well, all I, was, places? I was actually born here. Oh, you were? Uh, yeah, I was born here, uh, grew up here. Uh, when I came back from the military, uh, I wound up in Los Angeles, uh, became a member uh of uh, Outlaw Motorcycle Club down there, and uh, in 1978, uh, grabbed a handful of guys and moved up here. Uh, it was a completely different town back then, mm-hmm. and a uh, very small uh, community, a very small uh, 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 police department, and uh, just... <laughs> <laughs> I read it. I that, read was, it. <laughs> that was one of the reasons we came here. <laughs> and uh, uh, it... Uh, was quite a scene you know we uh, had a lot of fun kind of had free reign of the town for years and years uh, until uh, probably the turn of the century mm-hmm. oh shit um when so i i heard this is just you know rumors and, and stuff like that i heard that when when you ended up coming down you didn't have a lot of guys that came with you and so you went out to pierpont and and started recruiting is that well, all true? It, well, it, it's not really true, but there is some substance to what you're saying. It, we came here with a handful of guys out of Los Angeles, and we were in the middle of uh, a real shoot 'em up war down there with another bike club. And uh, we decided we would uh, come down here and uh, try to regroup a little bit. And uh, what happened was a lot of the street gangs from around here, Midtown, uh, Avenue Gangsters, uh, uh, Pierpont and whatnot, uh, we started interacting with them and a lot of the guys liked what they saw and they started getting motorcycles and eventually a lot of those guys started drifting over to the club. Now, uh, certainly law enforcement had a different perception. They thought that it was some sort of hidden agenda we were doing, but Mm -hmm. the reality was those guys wound up liking to ride motorcycles. And uh, that drew him to, you know, the outlaw bike uh, lifestyle. Nice. <clears throat> when you guys, and this is all just curiosity, you know, when I, when I was doing a little research, I, I noticed, uh, you know, you guys started, um, your organization started as a community, like helping out the community a lot, a community service. 
Um, well, you know, yes and no. You know, we were actually, at the end of the war in 1948, uh, a lot of the guys that had come back uh, in the uh, Hells Angel bomber unit and uh, paratroopers and whatnot started riding bikes in uh, Fontana. And uh, that's where the club really originated, in uh, San Bernardino, Fontana area. And uh, initially, the club's name was a different name. It wasn't the Hells Angels. It was the pissed-off bastards from Bloomingdale <laughs> called the Pooh Bobs. And then Otto Friedley and the other leader in the Pooh Bobs uh, kind of had a falling out, and Otto uh, uh, grabbed about half the club, and uh, that's when they became the Hells Angels. Nice. Um did, if ever, um, did did the community stop coming first? Well, or, you know, and and if it did, when? Well, we interacted with the community, but you know, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, we were a self-serving kind of organization. Oh, we sure. were in it for partying and having fun and building motorcycles and riding and really uh, kind of doing our own thing. Do you and, make a uh, good living at that? Well, uh, it depends uh, uh, what you're doing. <laughs> There's a lot of avenues uh, to venture off into. But, you know, I, I walked into this world in 1966. Uh, there was a local club here called uh, Question Marks, and they were one of the original 1% clubs. And uh, from there, I met the Saint and Slaves in San Fernando Valley, and then ultimately I, you know, met and became uh, a member of the Hells Angels. But, uh, you know, the uh, lifestyle is a lot different now than it was back then. Back then, uh, you couldn't walk into the Harley shop and buy a custom motorcycle. You had to build it. And if you didn't know how to build it, you weren't accepted by the uh, culture that, uh, you know, was living that lifestyle. And it was strictly a, a real party type of lifestyle. It wasn't uh, uh, about... Uh, uh, controlling people or powers and whatnot you know now you've got a lot of these different clubs that are at odds with each other and fighting and whatnot back in the old days if you got in a fight with somebody you probably would wind up going to breakfast with them uh after the bar closed <laughs> a whole different scene um when you when you guys are are you know doing your thing and um especially you know the the tattoo deal um, because I had a, the guy who'd done my tattoos, he was, he started maybe early 2000s, started passing out things and, uh, like, oh, I do tattoos on my house. And one day he was at O'Leary's or, uh, Dargan's and two okay. dudes sat alongside of him and said, that's the last time you're going to pass it out. Uh, do you think he's full of shit or is that probably something that happened? Well, it would depend, uh, uh, who he was passing it out to and who told him to stop. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, there's a lot of rumors that uh, in 1976, the uh, first tattoo shop in Ventura was open, and uh, a guy named Scurvy George owned it. And in 1978, that's when we moved into town here from Los Angeles. But Scurvy and I were friends, and uh, uh, Scurvy basically drank himself to death. And he get, left his shop to me, and uh, so I got in the business around 1978, 1977. But it was a whole different industry back then, and there were no other tattoo shops in the town. There was a tattoo shop here in Ventura. Jimmy's was in Oxnard, and that was it. And uh, uh, did you guys feel that as competition? Uh, no, because we never went to Oxnard, and he never came to Ventura. So uh, I think it was an unwritten understanding. And, uh, you know, a lot of people misinterpreted uh, what was going on here. And then ultimately there was a uh, – uh, I got indicted in 2011. They said I ordered uh, fire bombings of uh, a couple of tattoo shops. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, to this day I still say uh, – that never happened, you know, uh, I wound up taking a plea deal because when you're looking at three life sentences and they offer you, uh, you know, five years, I did three years and I'm now I'm back home. Yeah. What happened to your shop in Ventura? Did it close I down? Sold, I oh, sold, sold that it? shop. Oh, okay. Yeah, I sold that shop. <laughs> when I got ready to leave for a prison, I was going to uh, go to Texas. They were sending me to a federal prison in Texas. Uh, I sold the shop uh, to a businessman. What's, what's the story about 
um, the Hells Angels and, and um, um, the uh, the Rolling Stones. That, that that thing that happened at that time. Well, you know, this goes back to the Grateful Dead again. The uh, uh, Rolling Stones wanted to put on a free concert up in uh, the Bay Area, and you know, initially they were going to put it in the park because the Dead used to go out there and play. And what you have to remember back then, like. You know, the Grateful Dead would come to a Hells Angel clubhouse and play. Uh, Chocolate George, who was a Frisco Hells Angel, uh, his girlfriend was Janis Joplin. And uh, Jefferson Airplane would come and play at clubhouses. So, you know, we had a real in with uh, all the musicians in the Bay Area up there. And uh, we also had an in with uh, Osley, who was making all the liquid LSD up there. <laughs> uh, That's a good fun to have. But... Uh, what happened was the Stones manager went to Rock Scully, who was the Grateful Dead's manager, and said, hey, we want to put this concert on. And Scully uh, said, well, uh, we'll get the Hells Angels to do security. And that's how that started. But, you know, what happened was uh, Meredith, Hunt, Meredith Hunter got stabbed at the concert and died. Alan Pizarro stabbed him uh, because he was pointing a gun at the stage. And anybody that's seen Give Me Shelter, that you know, they can see that, you know, he did have a gun. And uh, uh, Alan thought he was doing the right thing. Whether it was uh, the right thing to do or not, you know, remains an argument to this day. Yeah. But the rift between us and the Stones was they said that if anybody got in trouble protecting them, they would pay for it. And they refused to pay for Alan's uh, lawyer. So we had, like, a, started in 1969, and it ended... Uh, uh, I was there when they uh, gave the check finally uh, 10 years later uh, uh, you know it was a $50,000 legal bill and you know Jagger's got more money in the world and he, he didn't want to pay the uh, legal bill and ultimately uh, uh, Mr. All. He, he decided uh, he would pay it in, bo in both the cases they, they had as a mistrial, right? He was, right? He, he was uh, no, he, he was, uh, uh, Pizarro was found uh, to have acted a justifiable homicide because of Meredith had a gun. And it was, it, if you see the movie Gimme Shelter, you can see the silhouette of the gun on his girlfriend's dress and he's shooting uh, at the stage. Yeah. He actually shot at the stage? Yes, he yeah. did. He shot someone in the shoulder, yeah, right? Yes, I think he shot one of the members uh, in the shoulder or leg, I can't remember. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, Keith Richards, he wanted just to pay the bill. He said, just, just pay him. But you know, Jagger didn't want to pay, and uh, uh, he was such a pussy when that was going down, too, huh? Oh yeah, he was a crybaby. He's still a crybaby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're we're here with George Christie in the studio. Um, uh, he has a book out right now, XL on Front Street. Uh, tell me about this book. Well, you know, I, I in 2011 I decided after 40 years I was going to walk away from the club and Was that hard for you? Yeah, it was very hard. It was L a, emotionally or Emotionally, uh or mentally worried. Uh no, I nah, I don't worry about anything. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if I did worry, I wouldn't have wrote the book. But uh anyways, uh you know, it was a situation where if I didn't leave, it would have strictly been because of my ego. And uh I felt that uh, the club was going in a different direction. I'd been a leader in the club for 35 years, and you know a lot of the younger guys didn't share my vision anymore. So I felt it was, uh, you know, 40 years was a good run. So what, I What was off. the difference in the visions? Well, you know, initially it was all about riding motorcycles, uh, building motorcycles, partying, having fun. And uh, when I walked away from the club, uh, you know, we were actually, and not only, you know, the Hells Angels, but every major bike club in the United States was fighting with each other. And uh, it just didn't interest me any longer. You know, we were fighting uh, on five fronts. And what happens is when you run out of opponents to fight, what happens is you start, you know, turning inward. And I didn't want to be around for that. Yeah. Um. What year did you leave? Uh, 2011. 2011. Yeah. When you're, <clears throat> when you're, when you guys were here, were you guys fighting? I don't know. I'm not playing dumb, but 
we know the motorcycle game that we see around here a lot is are the Carnalises. Yeah, the the Carnalis have been uh, in Ventura since I can remember, and you know we always had a uh, good relationship with them and a working relationship with them. Uh, you know they would come to the clubhouse, our clubhouse, and party with us, and you know we would go to their events on occasion, and uh, uh, you know some of those guys uh, uh, I think drifted off into the Mongols. That was a, one of the major bike clubs we were having uh, issues with. And, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those situations where, you know, you have to evaluate, uh, is the juice worth the squeeze? And for mm -hmm. me, the, you know, the juice wasn't sweet anymore. And so you decided to... I just left. Yeah, I went to the meeting and left, and uh, that's... You know, how, how do the, you guys like? What's the formality of that? Well, I I went there and uh, expressed how I felt and uh, basically what I you know just told you here. And I said I was going to go my separate ways. Initially, everything was okay, and then uh, there was a riff with one of the other leaders, not around here. Uh, one of the leaders that uh, I had been at odds with for about fifteen years, and you know he took that opportunity to. Uh, uh, you know, go on a character assassination of me and whatnot. So I wanted to set the record straight, and that's why I wrote the book. And uh, I wanted to tell my side of the story. Uh, I found it kind of amusing that uh, uh, the Hells Angels would take to social media on a, a shaming <laughs> campaign of me. I, I found it kind of ludicrous. Oh. But uh, uh, so, you know, a after that uh, started, uh, and then, you know, there were all kinds of rumors that I had testified against people and I'd done this and I'd done that. Well, you know, when I got indicted in 2011, I'm the only guy that went to prison. Everybody else testified against me, including, uh, you know, three Hells Angels. Hmm. So, uh, you know, Basically, they said I was the leader and I had told them to do certain things. Uh, and I'm referring back to uh, the fire bombings of the tattoo shops. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to tell the judge that uh, it's obvious I didn't have anything to do with it because the tattoo shops were still standing when uh, they threw the fire bombs. Uh, you know, I think I'm a lot more accomplished than, uh, <laughs> than that. <clears throat> when, when that first goes on, you know, these, you know, your brother's telling you, you know, this is the dude who did it. He told me. Right. Like, what, what is the feeling that you have inside you? Well, I felt like they betrayed me. And, uh, uh, you know, they had gotten in trouble for other things, nothing to do with the tattoo shops. But, uh, you know, the FBI had realized I had left the club, and I think they felt it was an opportunity to put the squeeze on me to see if I would cooperate with them. Uh, and uh, I didn't, you know, and I, I wound up uh, on house, house arrest for two years fighting the case. And then I wound up, I got an additional year and I, I spent that in Texas, which was kind of funny. Because when I got back to Texas, the banditos uh, run the state of Texas. That's another outlaw bike club we've had issues with over the years. But uh, you have to keep in mind, I was the negotiator for the club uh, for 30 years. So when I got back to Texas, to report to the prison back there, the banditos were there, and I knew all the banditos that uh, were in prison there, and they had they had a cell waiting for me, and I wound up selling up with one of the bandito leaders, and so it was like a home week for me back in Texas. So they t they took care of you. Oh yeah, they took care of me good. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, I you know I developed a good relationship, uh, you know, with the banditos, the outlaws, the Mongols, all the clubs that we had major issues with. You know, I wound up uh, developing my own private relationships uh, with them on personal levels, you know, and, you know, we had uh, the Mongols, the Banditos, uh, uh, even, even, even the outlaws had been to the town of Ventura before, uh, uh, you know, we were getting a lot of uh, interactions with a lot of these different bike clubs, uh, even the clubs from Canada, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police came down here, they followed the Hells Angels from Canada down here, and, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting because they knocked on the door of the clubhouse. They wanted to take a picture in front of the clubhouse, and, uh, <laughs> which I found kind of ironic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, w when you when, all right, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, I mean, this is something that you know a lot of people drama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How have you seen that? Are you familiar? Well, I, you know, I haven't watched it, but I'll tell you one of the things. Uh, uh, you know, my oldest daughter's one of my lawyers. She's mm -hmm. always she's been 
and represented me for the last 20 years. I've, you know, been in and out of trouble, uh, <laughs> been to prison three times, and, uh, uh, you know, she has uh, represented me. And when we got ready to go to trial in this 2011 case, that was uh, one of the jury uh, voir dire questions. A, a voir dire is when you question the jury to find out if you feel you're going to get a fair trial from them. And if uh, one particular juror doesn't seem like they're going to give you a fair trial, you, you know, you can exclude them from uh, the jury. You get like 10 guys you get to knock off. So one of the questions actually was, uh, do you watch Sons of Anarchy? And uh, uh, who, who put that question in? I did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so they say yes and yeah they, every one of them said yes and the judge judge Wu had a really good judge and judge Wu got so frustrated because you know one of the questions we asked do you think george christie had knowledge of everything that transpired in the hell's angels motorcycle club and the uh, uh all the potential jurors said yes we do and then the next question was well why and uh, uh they said because they watch Sons of Anarchy. So, I mean, you know, it's a great television show. Uh, Kurt Sutter made a lot of dough. And, you know, I mean, you got to give Kurt Sutter, uh, uh, you know, you got to give him credit. He tapped into something that the uh, people in the uh, United States uh, went crazy over. I mean, you know, would he have eight seasons, six yeah. seasons? I, I don't know. It was ridiculous. It was. Yeah, it was really a long, that's a long run on television, especially nowadays. So, I mean, you know, the guy tapped into something and, you know, is it real? No, because you don't go out, uh, uh, you know, killing people every day, and you, you know you, uh, uh, you know, uh, you don't have the uh, uh, sheriff, local sheriff of town on your payroll. I mean, these things just don't happen. <laughs> yeah, but it looks good on TV, you know, and it makes for a hell of a story. You know, did when you saw it, like, were you like, yeah, that's my fucking craft right there? Well, you know, were you proud, you, like, you, you certainly. That on the big screen? You know, you certainly have an interest in it, you know, but, uh, you know, I don't, uh, there was a lot of people out there that lived and died for that series. I mean, you know, people would get a hold of me, uh, you know, am I watching it? And do I know what's happening? Does this really happen? <laughs> yeah. Who's your favorite character in there? Well. Or who can you relate to the most? Nah, maybe Jax. Jax? You know, yeah. You know, I think, I, you know, like the I said, I wasn't a regular but did you see how he passed or how he died? I did, yeah. Do you think – what do you think about well, that? Well, that's what I – I know what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was told. You know? <laughs> so I don't know, you know. You know, I don't know. You know? We're, 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 I, just, I just don't know. Like when you're watching it, do you call Kurt Sutter? What the fuck? That is not even <laughs> realistic at all. Well, I'm still waiting to hear from Kurt Sutter. He hasn't tried to – I haven't got a hold of him. He hasn't got a hold of me. But, you know, I have he... got some messages uh, through him. He had some guys in the club uh, – Giving him some advice and whatnot, okay. but uh, uh, he had some sort of series, right? A documentary. Well, For some that was I uh, you were in it. No, I wasn't in that one. I was in a the History Channel. I had a TV show on the History Channel, Outlaw Chronicles. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that as well. Uh, but uh, Kurt Sutter had some type of show aside from the Sons of Anarchy that dealt with. Uh, uh, you know, street gangs. Uh, uh, I think it had it. They did something on the Bloods and the Crips, uh, on the Aryan Brotherhood. You know, uh, major prison gangs uh, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. All right. What are you interested in now? Like, uh, aside from all, you know, you've lived an awesome life. You know what I mean? And uh, you served our country, so that's that was. All. I, I did too. I served twelve years in right. in the military and. Um, I got out because I fell in love with my son, man. He's a little asshole, but wow. still fell in love with him. And um, so, you know, I'm living up on Ojai now, mm -hmm. and uh, I, you know, I miss the ocean, seeing the ocean every day. But I'm living up there. I'm getting, you know, into it. I like it up there. You know what? I'm just relaxing. I uh, write. Uh, I've got a fiction book I just wrote, and uh, getting it published. I'm. Uh, what do you mean, like sci-fi or no? It's uh, uh, about a uh, guy that comes back from the Marines and uh, winds up becoming the leader of an outlaw bike club. 
So, uh, imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Is this like one of those OJ books? Like, uh, I didn't do it, but if I did. But if I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the things that they said, why did you leave that out of uh, uh, your memoir? Uh, well, read the fiction book. It's all <laughs> Do you, are you into, like, sports or anything? Well, I'm a, I'm a practicing martial artist. No shit. For, uh, since the, forever. since I was in the Marines. What do you... Forever. Yeah, forever. <laughs> what do you, uh, practice? I, I'm, right now, I'm, the last 10 years, I've been focusing on, uh, uh do you know what Cali is? Cali. Cali. No. Cali. Uh, Escrima. Uh, sticks and daggers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've been, you know working uh, a lot of sticks and daggers and you know anything you can do with a stick you can do with a dagger anything you can do with a dagger you can do with your open hands and uh, you know the Philippi it's a Filipino martial art and the interesting thing about it if you learn it traditionally they start you with the weapons like most martial arts you've got to work up to the weapons mm -hmm. and, and this type of art I was initially taught the weapons to begin with and as you become more proficient you discard the weapons and uh, uh, the motions get smaller because you don't have the extension of the weapon and you're doing everything with your hands. So you're doing all this trapping and uh, hitting nerves and uh, doing uh, a lot of stuff. And it's it seems more practical to me because, uh, you know, anybody can carry a knife. Even if you're a felon, you can carry a knife. Yeah. <laughs> so any of you felons out there, uh, uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is your art. Um, I just started judo. Okay, that's I've been what, that's, I've been getting my ass whooped every week. Are they picking you up and throwing you around? Oh my god! I swear to God, I, on Tuesday I probably got dropped on my ass. I, I'm not even over exaggerating. I'm probably under 250 times. That does not surprise me. Like the first, like, <laughs> like I remember I looked up at the clock. I was like, "What the fuck? How is it only 18 minutes?" And and, and, <laughs> and the big guys fall just as uh, quick as the little guys. And they they always pair me up with the biggest motherfucker. <laughs> like, oh, you, uh, hey Tim, well, how about you go against him? This guy's like 400 pounds. Well, just maybe your karma. <laughs> I doesn't. Uh, yeah, Jesus loves me. <laughs> Shit. Uh, all right, hold on. Let me pick up my notes. And then you come to my house crying afterwards. I know. I did. <laughs> hey, Pop. I, I th I'm pretty sure I fucked up my rotator cuff this past week. All right, let me see. Um, that's all the questions on that one. Let's do this one. All right. Um, out of everything... Like I said, you've probably you've lived a great life. You know, uh, you've seen a, a lot of things. You, I mean, learning a martial arts, uh, having a family, ha being a leader. Um, as far as the leadership goes, what one thing as a leader, not anything else that you wish you would have learned earlier or done differently? Well, let me say something about leadership. It's not a popularity contest. And, you know, if you want to be a good leader, you've got to do what's best for everyone. And, uh, you know, you've got to take the criticism and the lumps. And, you know, if you're going to be a leader, you have to have a vision. You have to have an agenda and a destination you're trying to take everyone that's following you. And if you don't have that, you're not, you're not much of a leader. And, you know, that was one of the uh, things that, you know, made me make the decision I did is the people that uh, I were leading no longer, you know, were – sharing the same vision as me and you know if the people you're leading don't have the same vision as you you're not going to accomplish uh, what you really need to do as a leader do you feel you should have maybe l let go earlier because no, of that I, 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 no I was satisfied uh, uh, at the and point. I think I, I left at the right time uh, you know everybody was satisfied with what I was doing but I was having more uh, uh I was having a harder time uh, getting people to understand what I was trying to achieve. And, uh, you know, my biggest thing was when I had a revelation the first time I went to prison. I went to prison in 1986, uh, federal prison. I got indicted for a murder that never happened. And, uh, uh, but I had to go uh, fight the case. I didn't have any bail, so I, I wound up spending a year in federal prison. And when I got down there, the first thing I asked uh, one of the other Hells Angel members was, who do we have a problem with in here? And he kind of laughed at me. He'd been, been in and out of prison for years. And he goes, well, we don't fight with anybody in prison. I said, what do you mean, we don't fight with anybody? He goes, no, everybody gets along in prison. 
And my thought was, well, if we're getting along in that small confined area of a prison, it seems awful ludicrous to me that we can't get along out here in the outside world with all these other distractions. So I, I went on a quest for, uh, uh, you know, from probably 1990 until I left uh, to uh, resolve all the issues uh, between all the bike clubs. You know, I went to Europe several times and negotiated with the Bandidos, uh, you know, went uh, back east, negotiated with the outlaws, uh, you know, talked to the pagans, uh, certainly spent a lot of time with the Mongols. And, you know, the interesting thing was all these people that we were at odds with, we all had common ground with them, and our mutual inter inter interest was motorcycles. And uh, it just didn't seem productive to me uh, or worth uh, uh, fighting with each other. It just didn't make any sense. <clears throat> How hard is the... Uh, oh, wait, let me... I don't want to go out of order. Um, go out of what, order. <laughs> I'm just like, I have so many I, like, You're out of order. And, <laughs> All right. What what would you think your greatest like out of everything you've done? What is the the one thing that you look back on and like I'm proud of that, and I I'm that I am proud that I did that. Like your greatest accomplishment in life. I, I think my greatest accomplishment. Uh, you know, we had a really bad war going over in Europe, and uh, the Hell's Angels in Europe and the Banditos in Europe were fighting. You know. Uh, we got in a gunfight in the international airport. A couple of guys got killed, uh, uh, shooting rockets into each other's clubhouses and whatnot. Uh, and uh, myself and a guy named George Weggers, who was the president of the Bandidos, we actually stopped the war from bleeding over into the United States, and we got the guys uh, in Scandinavia to, you know, uh, go to the peace table. I think that's one of my bigger accomplishments. Uh, well, what's the root of all these problems? What's the what's the point? And, egos. And that's egos. It? Just egos. I think egos. Uh, so you when know, you go there, you have to massage egos to the table. Well, you know, I don't think you need to uh, uh, massage egos, but I I think you you know you have what you have to do is you have to go to the table with an open mind and willing to listen to the other person's complaint and try to understand uh, what their issue was, but. You know, the police always say the wars are over d drugs, and it's they're not over drugs, you know. Uh, people can sell drugs uh, right in somebody else's area. They come in and they go out, and nobody knows the difference. The guys selling drugs uh, that are good, you know, I mean, people don't even know they're doing it. You know, they come and go, and most of these wars are over egos, and, uh, uh, and here's the interesting thing. Two of these wars were over women. And, uh, Fucking uh, bitches, huh? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> hey, hey Always trying to fuck our shit up. <laughs> but uh, uh, they, don't try. Well, they so, don't try; they just do it. You so you know, yourself. things like that, uh, uh, you know, happen. But you know, it's usually over uh, hurt feelings, egos, misunderstandings, uh, uh, and women. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, <laughs> What is the one heartache in life that you've uh, had that you, it's just well, fucking my, hard my, to get my over? My son, uh, Georgie, uh, died uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, he went to sleep and never woke up. He was 39 years old. His respiratory system shut down. Burying a child is out of the order of things. And uh, that's a very difficult, uh, you know, that's a a club that I wouldn't wish any parent into. But bearing the child is out of the order of things, and yeah. it, it, it hurts. I can imagine. Um, <clears throat> Do you believe in God? I, I believe in a higher power. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I, I think that this is too complex. To it is, right? To, so, you know, I don't know the answer. Uh, I don't go to church. Uh, uh, you know, if I stepped into church, it'd probably collapse. You know? <laughs> but I, you know, I don't go to church. But I, I do believe in a higher power, and I, I don't know what it is or what it's about. Uh, it's a real mystery uh, for me. And you know, I've studied a lot of uh, different religions, and uh, uh, you know, I respect all religions. Uh, I, you know, 
I don't understand uh, the motive for going to war uh, over religion. But, I mean, I guess we're in the midst of that right now. You know, it's one of the prominent that, things going on. In, 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 there's a war going on in the United States, and it's called Republican versus fucking Democrat. <laughs> and, and to me, that blows my mind because it doesn't fucking make sense to me. Like, no. every, it, oh, like Republicans are for, uh, you know, life, but they want to go to war. Right. You know, and, and Democrats are for crying and complaining. I, I'm not either one, but... It, it, it just seems like they, they want to fight each other just for the sake of egos, you know what I mean? Well, you know, I think we've reached a point in time where, you know, I started paying attention to politics uh, in the 60s, and this may sound lame, but uh, but I, I'm speaking from the heart. When President Kennedy got killed, it really uh, affected me. I was in high school, and uh, my family was a big Kennedy supporter and then you know everybody had high hopes that uh, uh, he was gonna you know make some significant changes and when he got assassinated it, uh, it, it impacted the whole nation and I started paying attention to politics and uh, you know this rhetoric's been going on since then but I've never seen it uh, at this level that it is right now you know, it's, uh, I think that, and I'm going to get into it here, and I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Go. You know, Shoot. we got a guy that bragged about grabbing a, a woman's pussy. I wrote a song about that shit, and he, too. You know, he's a, as far as I'm concerned, he's a sexual predator. Yeah. I mean, somebody treats somebody like that, uh, that's not the way to behave. And, you know, now his picture is in every public school across the United States. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's hard for me to swallow. And I'm, you know, I never wasn't a big Clinton fan or I wasn't, uh, I think she would have done a better job with the exception that she would have got raked over the coals uh, uh, and got nothing done. I, I think we're, in a, at, we're just in a precarious situation politically. And maybe this is a wake-up call for everybody in this country. You know, I think uh, I it's think we weird, don't come right? together. What's that? It's just weird now. Yeah, it's it's very weird. Like, uh, like uh, our community. Like I'm all for community here, and like I love my community. I love even people I hate me. I don't give a fuck. I still love you guys. See, like this is I fight for this community. I bleed. I fucking I sacrifice a lot for it to 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 bring people some sort of happiness of uh, in form of entertainment or supporting their music or supporting their art or their business like well music is an art you yeah know? and it's an expression and it's an extension of uh, uh, individuals uh, you know and to some people they may not understand this but you know building custom motorcycles uh, it's an art was a, it's a, it's it's an art you know and uh, you know when back in the old days when somebody rode up on their motorcycle, you couldn't go buy parts in a motorcycle shop. There were no motorcycle shops. If you didn't build the parts yourself, you didn't have a custom motorcycle. And when somebody rode up somewhere, you could tell where they were from by the style of motorcycle they were riding. It was almost like an accent. And uh, it was like a, a regional thing. You knew this guy was from Ventura because this is what his bike looked like. Or you knew this guy was from the Bay Area because that's what his bike looked like. That's what the guys were riding up there. And uh, it was it was a beautiful thing, man. It, it, this whole political thing right now it has literally divided our community. Well, and, it has. And, it's divided our country. It has divided our country, and and, and people like and they and, and people everyone in here like it's my guys. You guys can say yeah, 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 but you guys are all guilty of it too. You guys all have to throw your two cents in there to get all these motherfuckers riled up, and everyone wants to get riled up and fighting each other. <laughs> it, it, I'm just I'm. I'm fucking over it, guys. Fuck it all. Like, we need to worry about ourselves, not fucking things that we can't control. Amen. Where'd You're guilty of it too, Jose. <laughs> Sabi, you do the I same agreed. Shit. What the fuck are you putting yeah, in though. You do, though. <laughs> you do, though. <laughs> or what about yeah, ghosts? I, I just like to fuck with people. Dan. I'm guilty of that, too. Do you believe in ghosts? Do I believe in ghosts? Uh, I believe uh, uh, anything's possible. I think that ghosts are energy. And uh, uh, I think some of the uh, energies displaced, and uh, you know, maybe that's where paranormal things uh, uh, come in. I'll tell you, I've had some uh, 
weird experiences, but of course I was like four or five uh, drops of acid. <laughs> <laughs> Null and void. <laughs> You know, we were coming across country one time. I feel you, man. <laughs> and and they, we spilled a bottle of liquid acid. Oh, you got to look and that up. So we took, we took toilet paper and p- took a roll of toilet paper and daubed it up, and we got back to the clubhouse. Everybody's eating toilet paper? Well, <laughs> what we did is we, we put it in the bathroom. Oh, yeah? Oh, and they wiped the bottle. Everybody that used it. Uh, they uh, got a trip. Oh, they had a trip. We had a trip. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> aliens? Aliens? Well, you know, that goes back to the higher power issue, you know. I, Do you I, believe we're put here by aliens? Well, <laughs> I, I believe uh, uh, that we may have been visited by aliens, but I don't think they probably, uh, if they have the you know, ability to travel and come here, they probably don't respect us too much. They probably think we're pretty confused. <laughs> Dumbasses. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So, I mean, you know, nothing's, you know, who am I to say no, you know? I mean, I don't know. I, like I said, I, this, is, this whole place is really hard to explain. And, uh, you know, it goes deeper than uh, the surface. Um, I got four questions left. <clears throat> did you used to promote music? I did. Tell me about it. That's what I do. Well, you well, know, I had, a, I had a concert promotion <laughs> business. Jerry Garcia... Uh, Is that who you had with he you? He got me in the business. Oh, cool. And uh, I did, you know, Jerry Garcia, Waylon Jennings, Johnny Paycheck, uh, Ricky Nelson, uh, 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 Doug Kershaw, a lot of country and western stuff, uh, David Crosby, did, you know, did a lot of stuff. Had a successful concert promotion business. Uh, I, I, I recently... Um, saw an interview with David Crosby, and he was talking about you. Like he was? He, yeah, he likes you. He, yeah. lo- he loves you. Like, yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah. 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 He, you know what? He, he's a really uh, great guy, and I, I've got another guy that uh, I took his music to, uh, I won't even drop his name, but a famous record producer, and this guy was in prison for like 10 years. He went to prison when he was probably, he went to like youth authority, so he was young. He got out when he was 25, and uh, you know, he's a hip hop rap artist. He lives down in, well, he lived in South Central. And when he got back there, I was trying to drag him up here uh, to live uh, because this guy's lyrics were uh, incredible. And now he's, uh, he's still sending me music, but he's in prison and he, they, he's got a, cell phone in there and he does stuff i don't know how he's doing it but he sends, <laughs> he sends me stuff uh, he's doing it and he, you know this guy's <laughs> lyrics are incredible but i took the music to uh, this producer and he told me if he would have been on the streets when all this when the hip-hop craves and the uh, rap uh, really blew up uh, uh this, you know, the guy would have probably been a, a Grammy-winning uh, rapper, uh, but he, uh, you know, he's doing another bit now. So, I mean, you know, hopefully he'll get out. You know, if see if you're listening, I'm still thinking about you. There it is. All right, two questions, uh, three questions left. One is um, probably a longer one, and two are real short. Okay. <clears throat> when you get patched in. Typically, what can you tell us about, like, what is that process like? Well, it's, you know, it's a long, drawn-out process. and you know, just like a little bitch, or? What's that? Are you just a little bitch for a while? Well, or? You, you, well you're certainly, we don't like to use that term, but uh, 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 you really put me on the spot here, man. Uh, you know what? You're, uh, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, like a servant, <laughs> you know, go to the store, go do this, go do that. Uh, it's a tedious uh, task, and you know, it's like being a pledge for a fraternity or something. But yeah, it's uh, like you're a red light, but yeah, people yeah. bitch here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be treated like that. Yeah, and what do they do ultimately? <laughs> they get, walk. Get treated like that, or yeah, I, get, well, you either get treated like well, that. You or guys you are walk. like Outlaw Bike Club, then. Yeah, except for <laughs> without the bike, can't handle it. Uh, beat it. Yeah, yeah. kick yeah. rocks. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, two questions left. Do you watch WWE? Uh, I have <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. No one's asking you. <laughs> Should I say yes? Yeah, just to piss him <laughs> off. Huh? <laughs> yeah, he won't talk shit if you say yes. Huh? <laughs> you, 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 what's your favorite movie? My favorite movie of all time is uh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Okay, I was thinking you were okay. going to say The Wrestler. Oh, The Wrestler yeah, with, uh, with Mickey Rourke. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. Um, so you, when's the last time you were into it? No, nah, it's been a while. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I, like Hulk Hogan, 80s? Yeah, yeah. When, you know what? When I got back from prison in Texas, I got so used to not watching TV. Uh, that, Like in Texas in the TV room, man, it was... You know, brutal. There's people in there fighting and stabbing each other over the TV channels, and uh, uh, I wasn't that big of a TV fan. <laughs> it was a worth it, huh? Yeah. So me and uh, you know, and I, I was living with the uh, Sinaloa cartel guys. The bandito and my guy and myself lived in the middle of these guys because nobody wanted to live with them. But we had a, we had a cell that was. It doesn't sound like much, but it was like five inches bigger than the other cells. <laughs> That's yeah. everything. Oh, huh? man, yeah. We were like in a Cadillac, you know? Uh, so I didn't go to the TV room. So since I've got home, I really haven't got back into watching TV. And my last question to you is uh, you are a well-traveled man. You've done a lot. What would you... Like, what's the greatest piece of knowledge, like, straight from your heart, whether it be uh, don't do this or don't do that, or what have you learned about l life and love and, and in this world that you you can help other people who haven't been through that, who haven't experienced that much right. life? Look, if you can learn to accept people on their terms, it's like a, it's like a release, man. It's a... Uh, uh, it, the biggest key to knowledge is accepting people uh, for what they are and trying to understand them. And, that you know, that's the basis of this country. Yeah. And I think we're off track uh, right now. And hopefully I, really? that's what I hope happens. Uh, I hope people will be willing to uh, accept each other for what, they're, for what they are, you know. Well... George, where's your book at? Is it at the yeah? Where can we people find you? You can uh, get it online. It's at all major bookstores, independent bookstores. It's you know Barnes and Noble, uh, independent stores, Amazon. Uh, and what's it called again? Exile on Front Street. Okay. Also, don't forget uh, Outlaw Chronicles on History Channel. History Channel. And uh, you have look a for my new book, Marked. 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 All right, marked. And do you have a website where people can... GeorgeChristie.com. GeorgeChristie.com. Well, guys, this is the Red Light District Show. You've listened to George Christie. Let's give him a you're, round of applause. This was fucking you're awesome. You're kicking me out of here now? No, you can kick it with us for the rest of the Hey, George, I got some songs for you. I got a couple good songs for you if you want to hear. <laughs> okay, I'm waiting. All right. Um, oh, yeah.